in the 1920s, Hollywood was flush with money and they started building these fantastic movie palaces. It offered people who lived in tenements that were crowded and non-air conditioned a wonderful escape to a place that was beautiful, vaulted ceilings, ornate chandeliers, intricate murals, and of course, air conditioning. And all this for the price of a 30, second, a 30 cent ticket. So they could see a cartoon, a B movie, an A movie, and often there would be live performances, which was Hollywood's way of sneaking in some vaudeville performance as well. Of course, there was a big surge in a Hollywood attendance at theaters with the beginning of the talkies. It was another innovation, and everyone was excited to see. Uh, well, Mr. Simpson, we're really rolling. Yeah, well, you can stop rolling at once. Huh? Don, Lena. All right, everybody, save it. Save it. Tell them to go home. We're shutting down for a few weeks. Well, don't just stand there. Tell them. Everybody go home until further notice. What is this? Yeah, what's the matter, R.F.? The jazz singer. That's what's the matter, the jazz singer. Oh, my darling little mammy. Now, little mammy. My your little baby. No, no, this is no joke, Cosmo. It's a sensation. The public is screaming for more. More what? Talking pictures. Talking pictures. Ah, oh, it's just a freak. Yeah, what a freak. We should have such a freak at this studio. I told you talking pictures were a menace, but no one would listen to me. Don, we're going to put our best feet forward. We're going to make the dueling cavalier into a talking picture. <laughs> And things were going fine until the Depression hit, and then suddenly the big five studios had to manage the uh, huge debt that they had underway of converting the theaters from silent to sound. The big five studios, Fox, Paramount, MGM, RKO, and Warner Brothers, were the ones that had theaters. And then there was the little three, which were Columbia, Universal, and UA, which didn't have theaters. And so it became divergent business and creative models where the big five had the theaters. That was the good news that made them the majors. Um, however, during this period of transition, they, they struggled more because they had the added costs and debt associated with the theaters and the conversion. In contrast, the little three were able to survive by cranking out B-movies. Low-cost westerns were especially popular then, and this was a way for them to get very hone in on their skill set. As a result of the Depression, there were some very lean years, especially in 1931, 32, for the studios as they, um, like everyone else in the country, was managing the economic crisis. And uh, one of the interesting things that happened then was FDR uh, instituted New Deal legislation that helped the studios and it helped labor. So it was a two-tiered approach. Give me your help not to win votes alone but to win in this crusade to restore America to its own people. FDR was able to deregulate uh, monopolies like the um, studios, so not just the studios, but the studios certainly benefited. And at the same time, he was helping labor by instituting encouragement for the organization of unions and for collective bargaining. So it's an interesting two-tiered approach that was supporting both management and labor. And during this period, because of the FDR deal, um, the, the unions became really solid, um, really strong. You had the formation of the Screen Actors Guild and, uh, of course, the Directors Guild, the three big ones that still exist today. I hate to see that evening sun go down Oh, I hate to see that evening sun go down The unions became very strong during this period of New Deal populist radicalism, if you will. 
and it was a great moment for the unions, and it kept going, I would say, until World War II. So SAG was mobilized in large part by two things. It was the FDR New Deal legislation really helped the labor unions um, become stronger. But also, the, the other part of this is the Screen Actors Guild, um, the very high profile early members like Kate Hepburn and James Cagney and John Garfield were all willing to go on the front lines in support of the lesser known to the public anyway, craft unions, and so bolstered them at the same time that they were strengthening their own union. And all of this was, again, part of the wonderful populism of the New Deal era. If it ain't wrong, you're right. If it ain't dark, it's light. If you ain't sure, you might. It's gotta be this or that. But during this period, there was a, um, a certain amount of illegal activity going on where corrupt studio leaders were joining forces with the mob and encouraging their sort of gangster approach to suppressing labor organization. And it was the studio's attempt to try to control production. That was the period, I would say, late 30s, early 40s, when the studios had the most power and they had this charismatic, capable leader as well. I can't give you anything but love, baby. That's the only thing I pretty old baby. So Hollywood is definitely affected by the Depression, as every other industry was across the country. Uh, and there was a lowered attendance at the movie theaters. It was definitely a crisis of sorts, and they had to come up with cost-saving measures, which included lowering salaries, lowering the production budgets of their movies, and limiting the further building of new theaters. And so clearly there was a, a pulling back that was going on in Hollywood. But the theater owners had their own ways of trying to address this problem as well. First, they would lower the ticket price from 30 cents to 20 cents. And they also offered giveaways of dishware and cookware and um, raffles and whatnot during the intermission. And it was an intriguing way for them to try to pull people back into the theaters. At the same time, while you have these indirect methods, Hollywood was doing some interesting things as well. This was a period of surge of product integration. And there's this great article written by Charles Eckert called The Carol Lombard in Macy's Window. And it describes the paradox of Depression era movies featuring the high fashion, latest design and furnishing and interior design in the locales where Carol Lombard and Jean Harlow and these other actresses lived. And so you weren't just looking at the story, listening to the story, you're also watching the background, if you will. And while this is a subtle form selling a lifestyle of consumer culture, at the same time, the studio started capitalizing on that by offering corporate tie-ins with retail outlets like Macy's, who were encouraged to create knockoffs, inexpensive knockoffs of the fashions that the movie stars wore that were designed for regular people. And of course, we're seeing the continuation of that today with Oscar apparel getting reproduced in um, retail outlets like Macy's. So it's an interesting set of traditions of in the midst of all this economic problem that they're still pushing the consumer agenda. You really think you're going to like it here? Well, I must admit it's more desirable than living in a packing case on a city dump. Oh, that's where I met you, isn't it? Yes, miss. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember now. We were playing some sort of a game. A scavenger hunt, I think they called it. We needed a forgotten man. I asked you to go to the Waldorf Ritz Hotel with me, and uh, I'm a little bit hazy as to just what happened after that. I pushed you into an ash pile. Oh, yes, of course you did. It was very amusing. They were nice, clean ashes. I'm very sorry, miss. <laughs> I didn't mind at all. It was very amusing. Have you a handkerchief? There's a spot on my shoe. Would you see what you can do about it? I could have you fired, you know, but I like to see things wriggle. 
When I get through with you, you'll go back to your packing case on the city dump and relish it. The fact that there was um, escapist entertainment uh, was what drew a lot of people to the movie theaters. And um, the Frank Capra movies probably speak to this most clearly with um, the huge phenomenal success of It Happened One Night, followed by Meet John Doe and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And these films carried this populist spirit of the plucky individual rising to the top based on his or her integrity and fighting the, the corruption within big institutions like banking and big business and, and government. And of course the movies kept repeating this uh, notion over and over again because it was so welcome by the people that were struggling during this period. I wouldn't do that if I were you, John. I'm glad you gentlemen are here. You killed the John Doe movement, all right. But you're gonna see it born all over again. Now take a good look, Mr. Norton. And you see it not just in the Frank Capra movies, although those were hugely important and they were so important to Columbia that they offered Frank Capra his own production deal to try to keep him in-house. And he had his own production unit and he had a lot of creative autonomy and his, each of his movies were treated like this huge event um, and were, you know, once a year and it was a big, big, uh, a big deal in Hollywood. By far, the greatest picture of filmdom's top director, three-time winner of the coveted Academy Award, the most timely, the most vital, the most significant picture ever to come out of Hollywood. But at the same time, you have um, different kinds of genres, of course. You have Warner Brothers' gritty uh, urban realism, if you will, with the gangster movies and the G-Men movies, and you have the screwball comedies, mostly which were making fun of rich people. And so in every instance, um, even though you've got this diverse array of genres, you can find the thread, common thread of plucky individuals fighting the system. Well, you don't have to die to keep the John Doe idea alive. Someone already died for that once. The first John Doe. And he's kept that idea alive for nearly 2,000 years. It was he who kept it alive in them. And he'll go on keeping it alive forever and always. For every John Doe movement these men kill, a new one will be born. That's why those bells are ringing, John. They're calling to us. Not to give up, but to keep on fighting, to keep on pitching. Oh, don't you see, darling? This is no time to give up. One of the other genres that they have in um, Hollywood during this period is the anarchistic comedies. You know, the more famous ones are Marx Brothers and Mae West and W.C. Fields, but there's a lot of lesser known lights from vaudeville that we don't remember today. Then he tracked the way that Hollywood rethought the classical Hollywood tradition of creating seamless storytelling to stop, basically, and allow these moments of pure performance like you would see on a vaudeville stage. And it's perfect indication of the way that Hollywood constantly adapts to potential threats from outside. In this case, it was vaudeville. Along the same lines, you could look at Hollywood and radio and see radio as a clear threat to Hollywood. Only what really happened was an interesting synergy developed between them. Hollywood started looking to radio as a means to offer promotional support for their movies. So, and then of course, radio was delighted to have the connection to Hollywood, given the popularity of the movie stars and these stories. And so it was a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of situation. And you see a lot of the programming during this period is behind the scenes Hollywood. Um, you have Walter Winchell and Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper all doing interviews with movie stars, which is of course promoting their latest movie, much like we have today on talk shows. Prior 
Prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, Hollywood was accused by the Office of War Information in a study they conducted of uh, being too cynical and not taking the war effort seriously. And so fearing reprisals in the form of greater censorship, Hollywood stepped up and started making more patriotic movies. If you are the man I think you are from Brooklyn, you'll get Miss Hetty Lamar to seal it with a kiss. What about it, Hetty? Go ahead. Oh, no. to be useful as a soldier of the United States Army. Also during this period, um, interestingly, Frank Capra, the king of the populist movies in the 30s, suddenly shifts gear and becomes a filmmaker showing a great deal of patriotic fervor. And he was best known for creating, during this time, a series of Why We Fight documentary films. the Germans' insane passion to enforce their rule upon their neighbors. This passion for conquest reached its hysterical climax when Adolf Hitler enthroned himself as God and the German Führer. At the same time that this is going on, Hollywood is continuing to make movies, but they're all starting to look uniform in the way that they portray the genders. Men are portrayed, of course, as soldiers bravely fighting on the war front, arm in arm with the allied forces, and demonstrating that type of camaraderie and bravery and all of that. Save my life, Doc. I hope that someday you will come back to us. We'll be back. Maybe not us ourselves, but a lot of guys like us. And I'd like to be with them, because you're our kind of people. Thank you, sir. This is truth, ripped from the lives of one American Air Force pilot and his loyal and faithful wife. On the women's side, it's interesting because women are cast in one of two directions, typically. They're either cast as long-suffering wives and housewives waiting for their husbands to come home from the war front. Be a good girl and take good care of that baby. I will, Ted. Yourself, too. Oh, Ted, I, I'm gonna write your letter every day you're gone. I know they won't deliver them. I won't even mail them, but I'm, I'm going to write just the same. That way we'll kind of be in touch. Women are interestingly portrayed differently as um, three things, basically. Nurses, waves, um, which is female soldiers, or Rosie the Riveter style workers. All the day long, where the rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie the Riveter. But there's still this odd propping up of the domestic ideal that's going on in the underpinnings of these alternative representations. So you have things like keep your powder dry, skirts ahoy, and kind of silly titles demonstrating, I don't know, a less serious attitude about women becoming soldiers on the war front. I don't care if you were born on a tank and weaned on a hand grenade. I'll take my orders from the people entitled to give them. That attitude won't get you very far in the service, Par. Oh, don't make any rash predictions, Napoleon. The name is Rand. It's going to be mud if you keep trying to ride over me on that high horse of yours. At the same time, you have the opposite trend, which is Claudette Colbert in Since You Went Away. It's a very sentimental film about her trials and tribulations of staying at home during the long war front, dealing with her children and the day-to-day -day life. And at the end, there's like, her husband's returning, but the whole movie is about her waiting. So it's interesting, these two divergent uh, representations. 
And then if you go further into the post-war period, the Office of War Information was not done. There's strong evidence that they were really putting pressure on advertisers, magazines, and certainly Hollywood to reinforce the domestic ideal, get women to leave the jobs that they'd held in the Rosie the Riveter era, which had made them autonomous, powerful, self-supporting, and was quite desirable to a lot of women. When they suddenly a shift in gears, oh no, we need to get the women back home, wives and mothers, so that the jobs are opened up for the men. And so you see these tug at the heartstring portraits of women dressed in the requisite kerchief and coveralls of Rosie the Riveter, but then a child sitting on um, the mother's lap pleading, you know, when are you coming home again? When are you staying home, mommy? You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you. So it's interesting how these types of pressures were applied in the post-war period to men and women. The breadwinner husband and homemaker wife was a really strong component of the post-war films. And um, so there's an example of Best Years of Our Lives, which I think is an indication that Hollywood had progressed out of the war fervor into a more complicated vision of what it was like to be returning home. And it complicated both the image of the soldier returning home and of the wife. These are the great personalities who bring a memorable experience to glowing life. Samuel Goldwyn's masterpiece. <laughs> William Wyler, who won the Academy Award for his direction of Mrs. Miniver, wove a pattern of motion picture magic, with Myrna Loy and Frederick March living through the heartwarming second bloom of love. Dana Andrews and Teresa Wright feeling the breathtaking thrill of love at first sight. In the post-war period, 1946, Best Years of Our Lives was an early blockbuster, sort of a nod to what was coming. But at the same time, it was a more complex vision of what it was like for both genders to return from the war. In that regard, I think it was an exceptional movie. So it showed the complication for the soldiers returning, uh, missing limbs, or you know, having to take really sort of less than job, the troubles with settling down with their girlfriends and getting married. So everything during this period was, was complicated to be sure. All of them together, giving all of us the best years of our lives. An alternative film, The Hucksters, it had Clark Gable returning from the war, and he basically is being forced into the role of organization man, which is sort of a new threat that's coming around the corner in the 50s. And Deborah Carr, who is the widow with two children and, again, the sort of long-suffering stay-at-home wife model and domestic ideal, she gives him permission at the end of the movie to not take this soul-crushing job, but to get something else. But what's understood is that he will become the breadwinner father and husband, and she will maintain the home and hearth. So you just see this repeated so much that it's, you know, it's not coincidental. It just goes in ebbs and flows over which periods of Hollywood will show women in, you know, sort of stronger roles versus suppressed into domestic ideals that may or may not fit. I killed Dietrichson. Me, Walter Neff. Insurance salesman. 35 years old, unmarried, no visible scars. Until a while ago, that is. Yes, I killed him. I killed him for money, and for a woman. The idea of film noir is certainly a piece of this, where um, it's almost a reaction to fearing women who have been empowered, um, casting them as femme fatales that are dangerous to these poor suckers that fall in line with them. You don't know keys. Once he gets his teeth into something, he never lets go. He'll investigate you. He'll have you shattered. He'll watch every minute from now on. Afraid, baby? Yes, I'm afraid. But not of keys. I'm afraid of us. Certainly, film noir is another genre that's interesting in terms of gender roles. Women are stronger in these roles, to be sure. 
but they're also frightening to the men that uh, they line up with. So they're convincing them to kill their husbands or uh, commit other dastardly acts. And it speaks to the climate of the times where if women aren't sort of pushed into the domestic ideal role, they're threatening. Obviously, a lot of great movies came out of that period. And what's interesting to me is the end of that genre for some people is Kiss Me Deadly, where the central hero is almost making a mockery of the idea of the good guy, heroic detective, because he's violent towards everybody, he's violent towards every woman that he encounters. And um, the whole thing goes up in smoke at the end, of course. Girls fleeing in terror from things beyond description. <laughs> Who are you? My name is Mike Hammer. So a really huge transition point in the uh, entertainment industry, of course, is um, the division between the old Hollywood or golden era of Hollywood and the beginning of the new Hollywood. For most people, New Hollywood is used differently than I use it. It's usually used to talk about the Hollywood Renaissance films or the beginning of the blockbuster era in 1975, but I usually like to push it back to the post-war period. So the division line between Old Hollywood and New Hollywood, to me, occurs essentially with the Paramount Decree of 1948. So a really huge revolution in the way that the studios had conducted their business. You find the attendance plummets from its high point of 1946 to 1947, it starts plummeting. 1948 is the beginning of the television network's rise of huge audience participation in the suburbs, at home, crowded around the TV set with shows like Texco Star Theater and I Love Lucy later on. I've just found joy. I'm as happy as a baby boy with another brand new choo-choo toy. What's happening in Hollywood is the theaters are dying, both because of attendance is lowered, but also because they were in urban centers, and suddenly there's this big exodus to the suburbs. That are bluer than the summer So all these social, cultural, industrial forces conspire to cause the, the golden era to come to an end. In response to the fact that they've got lowered movie attendance, they start shuttering theaters, but they also have to reduce the number of productions. They also have to let go of their studio contracts. And I'd say that was one of the bigger, more dramatic changes. So suddenly, talent is cut loose. One of the things that happened is a lot of package production uh, producer deals emerge. In contrast to before, there had always been independent producers in Hollywood, but most of them, like Goldwyn and Zanuck and DeMille, had been in-house studio producers. So they had independence and autonomy, but they were still part of the studio system. In the aftermath of the Paramount Decree, you see a different formulation, which is the package unit production. And this means that they are responsible for finding the script, for attaching the writer, the director, the actors, and in some cases, locating financing. And then um, uh, they take it to the studio for additional financing and distribution and marketing and all the things that the studios do so well. So I call this not a flat out independence, but it's a form of qualified independence that emerged in the post-war, post-1948 era. And among the young generation of new package producers are people like Burt Lancaster, who is a new star of the moment, who aligns with his agent at the time, Harold Hecht, and later joins with another producer named Hill, but at this point it's HL, becomes HHL later. Hello, 
I'm Burt Lancaster, back visiting my old hometown, New York City. This is the neighborhood of 187th Street and Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, not far from where I was born. It hasn't changed much. It's still a busy, crowded place of many racial strains, neither rich nor poor. New York is just a huge collection of neighborhoods. People working, worshiping, enjoying their hard-won leisure, or trying to. Recognize that fellow? His name is Marty. Never heard of him, hmm? Well, you will, because we made a picture about him. No, I'm not in it. It's all his. But this is a picture I'm proud to be associated with, and the name of it is Marty. Marty is an interesting case history as well of the beginnings of a new marketing strategy and approach to independent art films. Marty was an HL production, so Hecht Lancaster. It was based on the Emmy-winning TV show and had featured an unattractive leading man, sort of simple folk, very modest production style. When Hecht Lancaster decided to turn it into a feature, interestingly, this is a little side note, they cast one of the actors that they had that was one of their clients. They were represent, representing talent um, as managers, and so it was like a double dipping situation for them. But on the good news front, it was they cast uh, according to the same notion of a non-star. No, Ma, I don't want to go to Stardust Ballroom because all that ever happened to me there was girls made me feel like I was a, a bug. I got feelings, you know. I had enough pain. I'm going to stay home tonight and watch the hit parade. Are you going to die without a son? So I'll die without a son. Oh, Marty, put on the blue suit, huh? Blue suit, gray suit. I'm just a fat little man, a fat, ugly man. You're not ugly. I'm ugly, I'm ugly, I'm ugly. Marty. Ma, leave me alone! Marty became this complete cause celeb of the new American realist cinema. And the launch pad for its success was when Walter Winchell called this the sleeper hit of the decade. And it continued to get rave reviews, and then it ended up winning the Palme d'Or in Cannes. And it just became the film that all tastemakers were promoting and everybody who liked cinema had to see. Harold Hecht and I produced this picture. Patty Chayefsky wrote it, and Delbert Mann directed it. And talk about stars being born. The performances of Ernie Borgnine and Betsy Blair make me proud to be an actor. And of the picture itself, well, I'm just plain proud. This collection of all these wonderful coincidences, essentially, allowed Hecht Lancaster to back into what became the way that we now launch independent art house movies, which is you really rely on positive word of mouth, great reviews, free publicity campaign. It also defined an adult, sophisticated audience for the first time. Before that, Hollywood had really been concentrating on family fair that was good for everybody. And so you start seeing this niche uh, or specific audience being pursued. And in the trade reviews, they start to talk in that way about, oh, this is for this type of highly educated, sophisticated audience. And it, it reminded everybody, oh, we could start making movies for that audience. I would say that it's the same tradition we see today with Miramax, New Line in their heyday, focus features and searchlight of targeting an older, educated, niche audience. You know, think about your typical focus feature that's up for an Academy Award or a Miramax pushing for Oscar contention. It's that same formula that goes back to the Marty days. In New York, the world premiere of Spartacus. Kirk Douglas, executive producer and star of the $12 million spectacle, arrives with his wife for the opening of one of the Great Wide Way's most glittering events. So you see a lot of these divergent tendencies. And Kirk Douglas formed one of these companies. There were a lot of these companies forming during this time. And three of the stars of Spartacus, John Gavin, Gene Simmons, and Kirk Douglas, who both plays the title role and produced the spectacular drama of the Gladiator's Revolt. I would say an early version of the blockbuster emerges and an early version of the art film emerges during this period. Again, most people attribute this to the later period of Hollywood Renaissance of 1967-68 and 1975 with the beginning of Jaws. 
But um, for my money, I think the, the 48 to 60 period is also interesting. And you see, it wasn't a case of the old school studio producers doing blockbusters or big commercial movies and the indie package producers like Lancaster doing art house movies. No, you're really seeing both doing both. And one could even argue that the younger producers are feeling more pressure than the older established ones to create commercial fare. So one of the interesting things that Burt Lancaster said during this time was that he makes one for the Pope and one for himself. And what he meant by that funny expression was that he makes um, one movie for the studios and the big com their commercial needs, and then one that reflects his taste and artistic leanings and maybe liberal leanings um, as a filmmaker. Billy Wilder. There's nothing quite like that Billy Wilder, some like it hot kind of laughter. <laughs> Are we dressing for dinner? You know, just come as you are. So you're pretty good with that racket. You should see my back end. Will you see me serve the meatballs? <laughs> Billy Wilder is an example of a director, obviously a very important director, who had a foot in both eras. He was big in the studio era, and he was big in the independent era. So he made this uh, famous crack about, you know, in the old days we made movies, and now we spend 80% of our time making deals. You know, it's meant to be ironic, but it also speaks to the fact that, yeah, the business has changed. It's become what I like to call more like running a corporation in independent wilderness. You can spend up to 10 years nursing a project along, finding the material by, you know, purchasing the option, hiring writers to do multiple drafts, going, you know, choosing this director and this actor, and then having it fall out, having the financing fall out. This can go on and on and on. You can get stuck in, in development hell for years. And so the combination of all those factors, were, that was suddenly the new reality for producers in the, in the 50s. Did you hear what I said, Miss Kubelik? I absolutely adore you. Shut up and deal. At this point, you're finding this um, threat from outside with European filmmaking. Um, but as Hollywood is wont, they're finding ways to absorb and conquer their competition. So I would say one of the things that happened um, in the earlier period, in the 40s, late 40s, was you have the, the neorealist tradition. And of course, those films are winning huge critical acclaim, winning international film festivals. So they're coming to the attention of the American movie critics. They're talking about them in this kind of mixed bag way, both celebrating how wonderful they are, but saying, oh, Americans do great movies too. And so you see this unusual, like, oh, we should be doing that. Oh, oh no, no, we should be doing what we do best, which is family films. So you see this schizophrenic response to these innovations. But as I like to say, then the cat was out of the bag and directors like Billy Wilder was making The Apartment and Irma LaDuce, and you've got Dr. Strangelove, and you've got these fantastic and highly original voices emerging that are definitely trading on the influence of both neorealism and uh, French New Wave. Has that plane really got a chance of getting through? Well, uh, sir, uh, if the pilot's good, see, I mean, I mean, if he's really sharp, he can barrel that baby in so low. I mean, <laughs> you ought to see it sometime. It's a sight, you. A big plane, like a 52. Vroom! It's jet exhaust, frying chickens in the barn. Yeah. I shouldn't tell you this, man, Drake, but you're a good officer and you have a right to know. It looks like we're in a shooting war. The hell. All of these trends, these sort of independent um, ventures speak to the fact that Hollywood was in disarray. Um, during moments of tumult and chaos is usually when um, the moments of most profound change in Hollywood. So one of the ways that Hollywood responded was um, they used to have A movies and B movies, and out of the A movie category, they had something called super specials, which were a category of epic spectaculars 
or what you could call Oscar bait movies, prestige movies, where there were literary adaptations, say, big budget and big scope. And this became the way that the studios redefined their business in opposition to TV. Because they go, well, we're going to do the stuff you can't see on TV. Traditionally, people assign the date of 1975 because that's when Jaws was released, officially the start of the blockbuster tradition in Hollywood. I go back a little bit further and I say, well, what about Ben-Hur? What about all those you know, rather huge sand and sandal biblical epics that uh, were making a boatload of money for the studios back in the 50s? There was a real clear division going on where if you put five million into a blockbuster in those days, you could probably get 10 times that back, as opposed to the two or 300,000 film getting a couple million back. So it was just the, the ratio was always in favor of blockbusters. It's just blockbusters were so risky. New York's Great White Way is aglow with excitement, lights, crowds, celebrities to welcome Ben-Hur into the low state, today filmed in color and widescreen. And now arriving, William Wyler with Mrs. Wyler, director of MGM's $15 million film. The excitement builds as Charlton Heston, who has the title role of Ben-Hur, arrives with his wife. They join leaders of the entertainment, business, and social worlds for this debut of the film, which is acclaimed a blockbuster, and to which the motion picture industry and the exhibitor point with pride. Ben-Hur comes alive on Broadway. In 1959, we talked about the fact that MCA bought Universal. It started a rash of subsequently non-media companies buying up the various studios. And the one that's most frequently discussed, because it makes the case so clearly, is Charles Bloodhorn. It was a businessman, essentially. It was put in charge of Paramount and really didn't know anything about movies. It started picking movies that probably would have made sense 10 or 20 years ago. Things like Darling Lil and, you know, sort of Julie Andrew-esque big musical fair, very family-oriented musicals. And this was so missing the boat in terms of the climate of the times. This was the beginning of the Vietnam War, and this is people protesting in the street, and the women's movement, and race riots, and so it was just so out of touch. And in that moment, these big, high-cost movies were, were tanking, and the studio was about to go under. And so they were rather desperate. And according, you know, the apocryphal story is that uh, these young filmmakers like Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper came in and pitched Easy Rider and Warren Beatty pitched Bonnie and Clyde. And suddenly you have these very low budget but absolutely mesmerizingly original, striking, vivid point of view movies that emerge. They're scared, man. Oh, they're not scared of you. They're scared of what you represent to them. Amen. All we represent to them, man, is somebody who needs a haircut. Oh, no. What you represent to them is freedom. What the hell's wrong with freedom, man? That's what it's all about. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. The change were game changers completely. And this, of course, is the launch of the Hollywood Renaissance that everyone writes so much about, because it was. It was an American new wave of art cinema, very much influenced by the French new wave, very in very direct and indirect ways. And so for the first time, you have everybody on the same page going, oh, oh, we can make these kinds of movies, can't we? And it turned out to be beneficial to the studios because they didn't cost as much, and um, yet they were huge phenomenons. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. 
Well, starting in 1975 with the release of Jaws, the studios backed into another revolution in marketing. Hollywood came to the conclusion, oh, we could try this approach, this mass saturation of marketing approach across the country. Well, now it was this upfront saturation thing where you'd now we do 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 theaters all at once. It was the same idea on a slightly more modest scale of blanketing the country and the media in the days leading up so that you get the biggest possible first weekend. That would generate word of mouth. That would go, you know, create the go-to, oh, I must go see this movie that we still, that still drives the blockbuster business today. <laughs> In the late 80s, with the beginning of VHS and, and then cable, New Line and Miramax were, at the end of the day, the only two companies of the independent market that really survived the debacle of the late 80s, early 90s. Of course, each was acquired by a major conglomerate. Disney acquired Miramax in the mid-90s, and New Line was acquired by Warner Brothers things change. So as you track the changes going on with the indie marketplace to the point where in the 90s every studio had their own indie distrib um, to make these kinds of movies, As Miramax and New Line built power and strength, the reason they lasted through the 80s and 90s and the other distribs didn't was because they had something similar to I make one for the Pope and one for me, only in their case they were making one for me, which was their art house divisions, and then they had their genre divisions. In the case of Miramax, they had Dimension, which was a cash cow producing Scream and Spy Kids and genre movies that did exceptionally well. New Line had its Nightmare on Elm Street genre franchise that just kept on churning out money, and that would offset their riskier art house projects. And I feel like that's one of the fundamental reasons why those two mini majors survived um, the, you know, the, the, the demise of all the other indie um, distribs that were more narrowly focused on just art house. The crisis that, the, that Hollywood's facing now is that there's so much competition for people's attention. There's, uh, they haven't found the magic bullet that's going to make people go to the movies on a regular basis. There's, uh, you know, 3D, but I think 3D is kind of disappointed in a lot of ways. IMAX helps, but it's not everything. It only really helps for things like, you know, Dark Knight, big blockbusters like that. And basically, you know, there's so much, there's so many other things you can do. You can stay home and watch the internet. There's any number of things that you can do beyond go to the movies, whereas, you know, when the movies started, it was the only game in town. And I don't think they've found a solution to that crisis. For every independent film that's made that does like a Moonrise Kingdom, which is doing really well, there are so many others that fail miserably. And you don't know which one it's gonna be. I don't think a movie like The Help actually is a solution, not because it wasn't successful, because it was hugely successful for the amount of money it was made for. It's just that you can't predict it. I mean, The Help, when they made The Help, no one thought it was going to be a hit. Nobody did. They started throwing money and marketing at it when they started testing it and realizing what they had, but they did on a very small budget. But I don't think that there's any formula, though, that works for it, because it goes back to the same thing. You have to make good movies that people want to see. No one could predict it. And that's the whole problem with Hollywood. Nobody, you know, the famous phrase, nobody knows anything. It's always, it's always a surprise. There was a time when blockbusters were seen as being the be all and the end all too. And now they've kind of seen, it's like, it can be such a disaster. It can be, you know, like a John Carter type disaster. Just the fact that it's a big spectacle means nothing. And that's why you have you know, franchises of the Spider-Mans and the Black Dark Knights, because people identify with these things. People like them, they'll go see them. And to create a new blockbuster is a nightmare. And the risks are really, really high. So intimate stories do become more popular in that context. It's not an aesthetic choice for to go intimate. It's just like that's what people can afford to do. They're trying to figure out ways to create interest um, with, you know, for less money. 
Michael Eisner, who used to run Disney, believes that you know, there's, a, there's a bit more value in having a series of little successes than a one big super production. I think that's true. It's still really hard to do, though, because that means that you still have to have a series of successes. And there's no guarantee that, that these small movies are going to work. It's always such a strange dichotomy because you have, on the one hand, this is a business. You're selling a product for X and you're trying to make, you know, for Y by selling by getting more back. And at the same time, this is art. So it, you never know how it's going to turn out. I do think it's still, at this point, no one is b banking on blockbusters because it's just so expensive to make them, to market them. And so you, as, by default, you go toward smaller films. But a small film doesn't necessarily mean an indie film. Indie films, by comparison, are very, very small. There's no doubt prices have gone down for actors, prices have gone down for producers, writing fees, all that stuff. There's so much downward pressure on it. I mean, I'm sure the financial crisis has had an impact on that, but the main thing is it's just they're trying to be smart about the profits of these films. You're trying to keep the price down so that you have a better chance of making a profit and they're trying to find every way they can to do it because they've seen it's like, okay, we can make money on these movies, but only if we keep the price down. Even when the economy rebounds, I think this is still going to be the case because it's the, it, the, the crisis is in movie going in general. It's not, you know, it's the, the audience is shrinking, uh, the DVDs have gone away, the, you know, the streaming doesn't make as much money as the DVDs. There's just not as much money. And that's not, and that has everything, you know, that has as much to do with technology as it does to do with the economy. And so there's a downward pressure on those prices and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon.